Good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to see you all. Thank you, Will, very much for having me here again. Zen is an everlasting subject. Human beings never cease to ask questions. Why are we here? What is our job in life? Where do we go when we depart? It seems that we have been circling around these questions for millennia, but only some kind of transcendental experience can give us the answer. These answers sometimes are put in books, sometimes religions made out of them, but Zen means getting back to beginner's mind and look for the answers inside. Hence the four principles of Zen, and number one is we do not depend on the scriptures. We use the scriptures, sometimes we read them as beginners, but in terms of our spiritual quest, we do not depend on them. We do not try and find the final answer in some written book. What do we do then? We look inside and we point directly to human mind. This is the second principle of Zen. Directly pointing to human mind means we take out the symbolic layers, we take out any cognitive frameworks. We do not want to interpret or reinterpret reality. We look at it as it is because we want to experience ourselves as we are. Our true nature, our substance, which has originally no name, no form, no life, no death, no coming, no going. In fact, it has no fixed quality or attributes at all. So the third one is actually the final point when you attain enlightenment. And Zen makes a very important equation. Attaining enlightenment means you attain your true nature. And if you attain your true nature, you wake up, you get enlightenment. The two are the same. Why is that necessary? Because just like in the West, there are many ideas and teachings about God. In the Orient, there's a lot of teachings about enlightenment. So over the centuries, they developed various definitions. Enlightenment is this, enlightenment is that, many, many kind of checklist items. But Zen made it very simple and very clear. And the fourth is transmission from mind to mind. It's not enough to have just a nice ceremony or to be clever, knowledgeable, even practicing for many decades by itself is not sufficient. What matters is, do you connect to another human being's essence through your essence? My late teacher, Zen Master Sung San, he used to say, if you're thinking, your mind and my mind are separate. If you cut off thinking, your mind and my mind are the same. Sometimes when we manage to keep some silence within ourselves and also between each other, we can experience this. Or when a fantastic musical concert is over, after the last aviso and before the first hand clap, there's a moment of infinity. And for these moments, it's worth to be born. For enlightenment, it's worth to be born. To wake up to our true nature is our quest, whether we call it happiness, love, fulfillment, oneness, you name it. We've been doing that for a very long time. Buddha Shakyamuni was born around 525 BC. And then you could see how Lao Tzu and Jesus and Bodhidharma and Saint Francis of Assisi, we as human beings marked the path to awakening, salvation, absorption, oneness, whatever we called it. But the 20th century is bringing us something that we have never experienced. First of all, in the last 100 years, we doubled our numbers. The number of human beings is currently standing about 7.7 .7 billion and counting. The last 100 years or so brought us two world wars, countless regional conflicts, and the depletion of our resources on Mother Earth. This is a very new situation. 
What do we do with that? The scriptures do not contain any explicit statement about when the seas are warming up, then do this, this, this. When you have more people on the planet than the planet can feed, do this, this, this. Nobody expected that. But there's one thing. If you want to avoid suffering, first recognize what suffering is, what the cause of suffering is, what the end of suffering is, and how to end it. These are the four noble truths. So from time immemorial, if our minds are clear, we can recognize these four pillars of our existence on this planet. Then we can handle a much, much higher number than we are handling now. But the collective output of human beings, as we speak, is very low quality. Why? Because we produce a lot of suffering to ourselves, to each other, and to this planet. If we were more enlightened, we would produce less suffering, therefore we would have more happiness. The equation is very clear. Therefore, Zen means attainment, not just thinking, attainment. And when you attain your true nature, you attain your job, what it means to be human, how we can give meaning to this life beyond just sustenance or su success or taking care of your family. All these things are necessary. But when you're done with that, and most of you are done with that, what's next? What do you do with the time potential that you have on this part of the planet and you are living in one of the best parts of the planet? What do you do with your freedom? What do you do with your beautiful mind, your able body? If you make one more step and you ask the question inside, what is this? What is it that sees with my eyes, hears with my ears, speaks with my tongue? What is it that says I? Then you are doing a true human being's job. If not, we are just alive. We follow sentient life. As the soul connects to the body and we are born, we grow up, we get old and we die. And most of the time, we do not look inside. We do not ask deep questions. We just want to live. We just want to get by. But as time goes on, most of us realize something is missing. I'm still afraid. Something is unresolved. I still have some desire, something is unfulfilled. I'm still angry. I haven't settled something with someone. This is the homework that we have in our hearts. And the Buddha and the patriarchs teach us that we can settle that. We can come to an end of our karma if we go back to the place where it was born. There are four kinds of karma. Individual, dual, family, and group. These four depend on each other. The last 100 years produced so many changes that we should look for patterns that can help us practice. In the old days, you went up to the mountains or you went into a cave, you secluded yourself. And then you just practiced, practiced. After you got some attainment, then you went to see your teacher. These days, wherever you go, whichever mountain you climb, before long, you can hear the sound of an aircraft. You can see some other human being. The noise of civilization goes up even to the most remote mountaintop. Temples are becoming tourist sites. Practitioners are more and more isolated and they have to go deeper and deeper into the mountain just to be able to practice. We're not talking about isolation anymore. We can't. Where is your temple? Do you have a temple inside? Do you know why you are alive? Do you perceive what it is that says I in your heart? We are humans and we cannot live without the concept of I. Animals do not have such concept. They just follow their own urges. So if we clarify this concept, what this I means, where it comes from, what it consists of, we can have a very high class lifestyle. We can see the true nature of ourselves. And that helps each other. That helps all of us. But if we don't, then our mind quality goes very low. We believe in the absolute nature of our ego and then we fight. We kill. 
we steal. And then we create a lot of suffering for one another. So let's practice while we can. In fact, we don't know how long we can enjoy the current blessings of material civilization. We are running out of resources, therefore, viable options very, very quickly. So find your temple. Maybe it's in the back of your garden. Maybe your next teacher is an alligator in the nearest pond. Where can you really practice? Outside temples are very good. That's why we make them. That's why we create refuge and sanctuary for human beings to practice together. Because practicing in a group is very powerful. It's stronger than a family, stronger than a couple, and definitely stronger than an individual. But the individual is the building block. If one mind is clear, the area, the environment around that mind is also clear. If one mind is not clear, the whole environment goes down and creates greed, anger, and ignorance. I think the main message of Zen is that if you want to understand the nature of this world, then perceive it as created by mind alone. It's not just in the Avatamsaka Sutra. It's truly the way this whole universe works. If your mind is clear, your experience is clear. If your mind is not clear, your experience is totally warped and distorted, and you cannot trust what you see. You cannot trust what you hear, you think, you feel, you say, or you do, because it's filtered through your dualistic illusions. If you have a camera, you can have the best optics, the highest class photographer, but if the sensor is broken or distorted, none of your pictures will be good. So how clear are we? How clearly do we think? Do we feel? Do we speak or act? How clearly do we perceive cause and effect? And if we do, we can increase our qualities. Starts with the mind. And if our mind quality is better, we can coexist better. If our mind quality gets worse, we cannot coexist with one another. Then there is war, famine, and suffering, many things like that. And it does not have to happen. Human beings do not have a destiny. We do not have something that we must endure. We have to see our own hand in it. We have to see how we make everything happen. And then we have a chance to become free. Free from all this suffering and attain true happiness. The United States of America is a very, very interesting country. It has a very special concept of freedom. What is freedom? To do what you want, to get what you want, to be with a person you like, to vote for the right guy. What is freedom? So if you explore that, then you can go deeper and deeper and deeper and find something that does not depend on any dualistic phenomenon, that does not depend ultimately on life and death. Then we can attain true freedom. Then we can truly help each other. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I could go on with many stories from China and Korea, and after a while it would bore you to death. I'm not taking that risk. What I'm suggesting is that we continue with your questions. Your questions that may pertain to what I have just said, or questions that is kind of knocking at the door of your own heart. So please, ask any questions you feel worthy. I find that the idea of freedom is a uh, transient experience uh, uh, for me because there are times when I do feel free in that uh, I'm not grasping, I'm not uh, fearful of losing something. Uh, I feel relatively complete and uh, feel able to live uh, comfortably within my own skin. But that doesn't usually last. What happens is uh, some situation uh, will arise. Uh, it could be uh, 
the sickness of my spouse or uh, a problem with another family member or a friend, and then I, I feel like I lose my freedom because I become uh, very uh, obsessed, uh, for lack of a better term, with trying to resolve that problem and uh, help the person and uh, feel better myself. So um, I, I'm hoping that through a practice, I'm uh, more able to uh, maintain that uh, feeling of freedom and uh, less able to be knocked off my uh, center and, and lose my uh, balance. If you practice correctly, then you can keep that. Because in the Orient, they really taught about the freedom of the mind. Once you take this body, you are in a dependent situation from your first moment to your last. Can you imagine that your lungs would say, well, I've served you for 40 years, now I need a five-minute break. <laughs> Not possible. This kind of body gives us three kinds of marks of existence. One is interdependence. We are dependent on people and the environment so much, we don't even realize it. Next is impermanence. The clock is ticking. It never stops. Whether you forget about it or worried about it, anxious or easy about it, doesn't matter. The clock is ticking. We call that impermanence. So in terms of relationships, impermanence is a powerful teacher because if do not put energy and information into something, it will start to go into entropy, it will start to disappear. Human relationships are the most sensitive things on this planet. They need constant maintenance, constant energy, constant attention to counteract this kind of impermanent nature of all phenomena. And the other, my favorite, is imperfection. No matter how well you want to do things, no matter how outstanding person you want to be, it just never works 100%. It's just never the way you want to be. You look at the three I's, impermanence, interdependence, and imperfection. Where is freedom here? Freedom is actually translated into getting what I want, not getting what I don't want, being in the company of those that I like and not being in the company of those that I dislike. These are the four smaller kinds of suffering if they don't work out. The four major suffering, birth, old age, sickness and death, whatever you do after you're, you're born, rest is part of the package. You cannot buy these items separately in the store of existence. Right? So what can we do? You mentioned family members that need attention. Let's find the mind's compassion in that so that we would develop the qualities that can really give us the human character that we want to carry forward to our next lifetime. It's okay that we were born into this body with this kind of mind. But is this that we want to carry? Is this how we want to do it again? And I do not expect you to believe in reincarnation, but just for a moment, play with the thought that it works. Look into the way you were born. Look at the backpack you brought with yourself, your soul's content. Is this the way you want to do it again? So, wisdom and compassion, they are not given to you. We have to work for it, sometimes fight for it, sometimes suffer for it. And then we become the human being that we like when we look into the mirror. I don't mean your bathroom mirror. I mean your mind mirror. And this is not just your conscience. It's not checking yourself. It's not judging yourself. It's looking at who you are, who you became through your actions, your speech, your thoughts, and your feelings. So Zen does not give you ready-made answers. 
but it gives you the path to awakening. And as you could hear it will several times, and I love to quote him for that, enlightenment is the solution. Turn it around, any other solution is lesser than enlightenment. So as elusive as it may seem, awakening is the solution. If we do not do that, then our ignorance creates more suffering. It's that simple. So I suggest that we perceive our true situation, our true relationship, then our correct job, our true function also appears. Okay? Well, I, I tend to be very uh, self-critical, judgmental. And so I'm judgmental of others as well. And I don't like the quality. I find it, uh, um, it's decompensating or it makes me less of a, the person that I want to be. And I'm not sure how I can change it, that nature because I feel like it's my default. I've always been like that. And even though I may be better now than I was yesterday, I, I continue to fall into that trap and cause suffering for me. Where do your judgments come from? A, uh, a parent, the way I learn to look at myself. They come from me, ultimately. Do you believe your thinking? I believe it um, initially until I start to feel the suffering from it. And when you feel suffering from your thinking, then what do you do? I try to let it go. I How? try to release it. How do you do that? I try to replace those thoughts with positive thoughts. So you try to put out fire with gasoline. We all do, ladies and gentlemen, but he had the courage to ask. Great. So it's very, very typical of us that sometimes we try to put out thinking with more thinking or thinking with feelings even worse, or feelings with thoughts. And if none of that works, then we start to talk. We project all this karma to our environment, to our beloved, you know, or we just go to a pub and start to drink, you know. But when that happens, we really make our karma worse. Zen means we return to the origin, where it comes from. So when we speak of Zen meditation, it's not some special thought it's not a box of nice, cozy feelings. It's not expanding your comfort zone, but it's returning to your tanjan, to a mind we call don't know. So when you attain don't know, you attain this point. When you hear the sound, then there is no thinking. And when you cut off thinking, your narrative stops. Your pattern of feelings begins to disappear. Your habits, at least for a moment, they are cut off. Meditation means that you keep this state. We call that clear like space, clear like camera. And if you practice, you can get that. It's not something remote. It's not something special. It is closer than you think. But to attain that, you have to cut off thinking. And that's the habit we develop. This habit of cutting off thinking and returning to our true nature results in non-dualistic wisdom, unconditional compassion, and intuitive function. Intuitive function is the direct manifestation of your true nature. So the question is very, very valid. It's very typical of us humans who do not understand karma, do not understand what to do with it. And we just try to put out fire with gasoline most of the time until we burn out. And then we blame the environment. Then we complain, the world is bad. People are bad to me. Or I am bad. None of these projections are actually true. We confuse ourselves with our karma. We confuse the mirror with the object, objects that it reflects. Let's be very careful with that. Imagine that you're in your own bathroom, looking into the mirror. And when you leave the bathroom, the mirror still reflects you, although you are already gone. 
Wouldn't that be scary a little bit? Your mind does it all the time. We call that holding mind. There are five types of mistakes. One is checking. You're worried about something, someone all the time is checking, 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 checking. Number two, holding. You can't forget. It's just in your mind all the time. You cannot put it down. Next is wanting something, always, always. It's not like your shopping list. Always desiring something, always negative attraction, pushing something or someone away. It's wanting mind. The fourth is attachment, identification. And when you identify strongly with your notion of self, then you keep making things up, projecting. So making, checking, holding, wanting, attachment. These are the five mind diseases that we always carry. It's very difficult to become free from that. But when we attain that, that's true freedom. We are not controlled by our karma. And when that happens, we can correctly recognize our situation, establish correct relationship, and have correct function. So Zen is not some art form that you practice without any reintegration into your life. The benefits of Zen practice show in your individual character, in your significant other relationship, the duo, the family, and the group. But there's something really interesting. The individual cannot fix himself or herself. So just by locking yourself in your bathroom and practicing one hour and a half of meditation, it's not going to work in the long run. You should practice individually as well as in the group. And if your family is into it, don't try to convert them. If your family is into it, then it's very, very blissful. It can be great. Then couples practice is also fine. It can harmonize things very well, much more than talking. But if you take out any of the four kinds of karma, by themselves they cannot be fixed. They need the environment, the impact of the other three. And then the mirror has many faces. So if you have an object and you put light just from one direction at that, the other side will be in the shadow. It's clear, right? You have only one view, then it is a big blind spot. You have another view, the blind spot halves. Another view, then it becomes a fraction. And if you have five, six angles, no shadow. Same with human beings. If you listen to just one person, that person has a blind spot because nobody has the perfect view. But if you're in a group and everybody has the same problem with you, then probably you are making that problem really. Okay? That's when group practice cleans it up and then you return to your own life and your partner, your family is actually happier. Oh, thank you for producing yourself in the 2.0 version. Much better. Don't lose the upgrade. <laughs> More questions? Thank you very much. I feel a lot of things stirring within me. I'm astounded how much, but I'm new to all this, so I'm not sure if it's my soul speaking or indigestion or I don't, but there's definitely something that's touched me. Depending on what you had for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> um, my question I like to ask you, and I'm trying to find a way to phrase it so it doesn't come out um, confrontational or challenging. It's not my intention, so I'm just going to ask, do you consider yourself enlightened? Do you consider this question non-confrontational? No, I don't, <laughs> but I didn't know how to phrase it any better. I apologize. You it's can't. It's not my intention. You can't. What would you do with the answer? I would feel more comfortable following, knowing the answer one way or the other. I'm, I'm wary of gurus. If I see the Buddha, kill him. What color is the Buddha behind me? Gold and bronze. That's it. How would one know, another way of asking the same question, that one's true nature has been attained? You should ask an alligator in the next pond. The gator will give you a perfect answer. And don't get me wrong, I really appreciate your beginner's mind. Keep fighting. You have more bullets? Shoot. Have you ever met someone who you consider to be enlightened? Yes. This time about 15, 20 people. Am I delusional to think that enlightenment is not so unattainable as all that? This is not a delusion, but it's way to go. 
It doesn't mean you have it. Also, it doesn't mean you don't have it. You work for it, then it becomes clear. Why do you resist answering one way or the other? Do I? Yes. I don't think so. I've answered you every time you ask me a question, maybe not the answer you expected. I disappoint. So disillusionment is part of our practice. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I used to think of enlightenment as something that was like a Hollywood parting of the clouds and the sunbeam coming down and the angels singing. But to hear you describe I it as... I love the imagery. Go on. <laughs> to hear you describe it as awakening, I feel optimistic that it's perhaps not as far-fetched or um, distant. I don't know how to describe it. At the same time, I'm probably kidding myself and I'm struggling. You are so entertaining. It's wonderful. Because right at the beginning of your question, you said, the way I'm thinking about it. That said it all. That's what made this Hollywood movie. Mm -hmm. What if you're not thinking? Mm -hmm. What kind of enlightenment is that? Virtually immediate. You're still talking, so you're thinking. Let me think about that. Does that help you? You already understand that it does not. As long as this machine is going, it keeps producing imagery that is not identical with the source. So first of all, when we begin to realize what life is, we stop being victims. Also, we stop being perpetrators. In one lucky moment, we realize uh, we are actually not just actors on an infinite stage without any visible director. In fact, you see that seat off stage with your name on it, which says directed by. And you can get out of the stage and sit there and see how this whole thing is made. We call that meditation. Turns out it's a movie. It's a very well made movie with 24 frames a second, so convincing that you believe it as absolute reality. But when you take a step back and you perceive it, you see how it's made and your mind stops moving, stops thinking, stops being attached or wanting, making, checking, holding, everything I've said before, then you attain the movie. Because your mind doesn't move. And you see, everything is made up of these colors and light and projections. So you look back and you find the projector's room. You take the stairs, you open it, it's empty. There's just a machine running. Nobody's there to control your life. Nobody's making this up for you, without you, unknowingly. And then you see that this machine has one big reel. That's your karma. And if you're wise enough, you don't burn it, you don't cut it, you don't blow it up. You just let it run out. And when it does, the movie stops. There's only pure and white light. That's all. And then you're very careful about the next reel that you would put on. This is the stages of realizing how we are actually creating this world for each other and ourselves. Well, everything I say feels inadequate at this point because what is there to say? But I am Why not curious. continue in the way you started? Go ahead. Say again? Why not continue in the way you started? Go ahead. Perhaps shifting gears a little bit. I'm curious. I also used to have a deluded notion that uh, enlightenment and awakening was uh, somehow a transcendence of emotions, that I would attain some sort of level of bliss. In Why which... would this be a delusion? Transcendence of emotions is a wonderful thing. You're not controlled by anything Freudian. That's good. Next. Well, th I guess that was my question. In, in your experience with your life, you know, practice that you've done, do you still feel the everyday emotions of anger, frustration, impatience, etc.? All of it, yeah. for a moment. Mm -hmm. They are just these blips, and they disappear. But if you don't hold them, you, you don't want them, if you don't check them, you don't make projections out of them, you, you don't identify with them, then they are just boom, boom, come and go. We are humans. We hear, we taste, we smell, we touch, we feel, we think, we speak, we act. There's no way that we could be humans without all this that you have mentioned. But your relationship to this karma is the defining factor. 
and go back to the movie theater metaphor. Do you really believe that this avatar on stage in the movie is you? Now that's the problem. Then you identify with your ego. You don't find the director. You don't find the projector's room. You do not let the real run out and you do not see your true nature. So we have a pretty long way to go. Enlightenment is the solution. It wouldn't have survived for the last 2,500 or so years if it was just something superficial. And those people who actually saw the disappearance of their suffering with new qualities appearing, that pattern shift is very convincing. It's not the words we use. It's not the ideas we pursue and definitely not the self-image that we broadcast, but our own change, deep structure of our hearts, the content of our soul, the way we relate to each other and this world. When that changes and your friends who maybe haven't seen you for the previous five, ten years, they said, wow, 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 you have changed. How did you do that? That's something. That's a telltale sign. Okay? Thank you. I would like you to um, explain a little bit more about the different stage of karma, which you already talked a little bit. So you're interested in these four major groups of karma, the individual, the dual, the family, and the group. I don't want to take away your eyes and ears. So I suggest that you really perceive what kind of thoughts you have, what kind of feelings you have. These are the two major internal processes besides the sensory perceptions. And then, what is it that goes out into the world in the form of speech and action? See your relationship to your significant other, to your family, and to your group or groups in society. See what kind of thoughts, feelings, speech, and actions transpire between them and you. Then you can see cause and effect for yourself because your, your question is so general. It's a good question, but it's a very general question. I cannot give any useful answer to that. You already did, and I would like to, to if you can explain, when you, when you said that the kind of thoughts, and we should translate in the actions on what you put out, but Tying this to what you just explained about the projection, how can we trust these thoughts that are not supposed to be our thoughts, but they come to our mind in a very believable form? So how do we discern what is a wisdom or a good idea or just a thought of the projection? And it gets confusing. Does the chocolate factory take responsibility for the chocolate that it produces? Yes. Yeah. Does the factory identify with the chocolate? Yes. No, it does not. But it takes full responsibility for it. Otherwise, the company would be sold in the sweet shop. Okay? Mm -hmm. But it's the chocolate that is being sold there. The factory stays where it is. So you are not identical with your thoughts, but you make them. You are responsible. You have the freedom to think and feel and say and do whatever you want. You are the factory. You make that karma. But once it's out, once you have done that, it's not you. But you have the responsibility and you had the freedom. So face that. And anytime you have this dilemma, think back of chocolate and factory. It's a very good metaphor. It's very sweet. <laughs> but it's only the chocolate that is sweet. The factory is not sweet. So you are not what you're thinking. You are not yourself image. You're not what you're feeling about yourself, all right? So the factory is made up of concrete and steel and glass and plastic and all these things that can make chocolate. These things are not sweet, but they have a very crucial, creative, responsible relationship with the product or products. Think about that. And then it can give you the right view. So if I may suggest, keep it simple, keep it clear, moment to moment, perceive with your mind mirror, what am I thinking right now? What am I feeling right now? What am I saying right now? And what am I doing right now? So all this is one question. What is this? What is this karma that I am producing? Sometimes totally unaware of cause and effect, action and result. 
and that's the next step that we perceive cause and effect. If your mind mirror is not just a little spot, but it's getting bigger, 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 then it can actually become infinite time, infinite space. Even before that, you can perceive cause and effect a lot of steps ahead, many steps ahead. Then you become wiser. You become more compassionate. You say, oh, I'm not saying this. Last time I said that, somebody got hurt. So I'm not saying that. I'm not going to do things like this anymore because it comes back to me in, in the form of somebody's vengeance. And I don't want that. So these are the learning curves that we take based on cause and effect. And some of these curves are very short, like throwing a boomerang and it comes back in like 30 seconds. You can see the whole trajectory. Some boomerangs go around the whole Sarasota. Takes a long time. Takes like an hour. It's a slow boomerang. Another one is faster, but it goes around the whole earth. It takes many weeks to come back to you. And there are some boomerangs that come back next lifetime. How do you know that you threw it? You do because it came back to you with your fingerprints. Let's be careful. And our perception, our clarity, is the help that we need. Okay? We can all attain that. More questions? It's so easy for me to make a thought or to make words. It just flows. And uh, I, I don't even know I'm going to start. And wow, it's just there. A whole book is there without any effort whatsoever. Uh, and those extremely rare moments when suddenly an intuition occurs. It's almost as if it falls out of the sky and I'm just so lucky if I don't ruin it. And it happens and I cherish it, but it, it's, it's almost as if I have nothing to do with it. And uh, I don't know um, other than falling on it by accident or letting it fall on me by accident. I don't know how to have what you just described. You know, Ask the sky again action. for that. Ask the sky again. Ask the sky that. again. Because your description is very accurate. Can we you? don't know how intuition works, yes. but don't know makes your intuition work. Yeah. That's the creative thing. So you, you return to don't know, your intuition kicks in. So, well, maybe that's, so this is why I'm crazy about puzzles. No, I have puzzles. you love puzzles, so you're crazy I, about them. I love puzzles. That yes. has not much to do with I don't know. My, I fill my life with puzzles because... Mm -hmm. Jigsaw puzzles? All Human kinds, puzzles? Word puzzles? Uh, and you math, love our congas. Puzzles, pseudo, Sudoku puzzles. Okay. All kinds of puzzles, difficulties, conflict puzzles. Uh, you know, what's wrong with a person? Puzzles, puzzles. no puzzles, no, no big yeah. difference. Do you get to the point of don't know during the, the puzzles? All yeah, the then time. it helps because it kicks your intuition into yeah. place. Because when you're thinking patterns, emotional patterns, so your IQ and EQ, yeah. they're helpless, your SQ kicks in, your spiritual. Yeah. So I'm doomed to a continual, continual feeling of falling off the edge of the earth. The so earth has no edge, it's good al news. Almost, oh, I'm a flat, I'm a flat earther. <laughs> I'm falling off the edge all the really? time. Really? So yeah. can you take me there? <laughs> I would love to fall off the edge of earth because, you know, I love intense experiences yes. like flying. Just yesterday it happened to me, I couldn't let go of it for 10 hours. <laughs> Over the ocean, I was in a cabin and I said, don't land but it was so boring that it had to land after a while. So, yeah. go ahead. But it's that feeling of, oh, I'm going to fail. This is going to fail. I'm going to fail then you because lose it. I don't know. Oh, no, 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 no. You see. No. You fail because you're thinking and you're worried and you kind of jump on that and you depend on that. And then then you lose don't know. Yes. The other kinds of loss is uh, more prevalent yeah. when people have a really good ride and they are in sync and they ride the wave and say, oh, it's wonderful, and then boom, it's gone. So if you're worried about it, if you're saying, hey, what if I lose it? You already lost it. So just come back to don't know, come back to your clarity, 
come back to the clear blue sky, to this infinite nature, and then return to this don't know as a very good strategy. We have the method. It's Tanjan breathing. It's focusing to the moment. It's not being attached to our karma inside and outside. We have plenty of leads. We have wonderful instructions. You just have to follow that, and then the experience is yours. But never confuse the user's manual with the object itself, with the appliance. That's why we don't depend on the sutras. Sutras are great. There are many wonderful shorter sutras without too many repetitions. Read them if you like, but then practice is necessary. Actual experience is irreplaceable. Can you imagine that you're in the desert and someone just whispers into your ear, water. Give me something to drink. And they say, Vasser. No, 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 I'm thirsty, I'm dying. And then the guy says, Lo. Or if you're Hungarian, someone would say, These. Paruski, Vada. Now you are already dead. Because you never drank, not a drop. You just heard the words and words and words and words. So we don't believe that we are in the desert of life and death. We are. With mirages all over the horizon. But birds do not follow illusions. If you look at the birds where they fly, they only fly to places where there's real water and no mirage. That means we can find the path. We can wake up. We can return to this wonderful, blissful feeling of dono, but this blissfulness is also a reflection. It's the first reflection. Then there is the worry. Then there is this kind of multiple layer of our intelligence trying to restore it until we realize that just by being intelligent, we cannot restore it. We can get to the edge. We can shorten the curve, but we cannot substitute the experience. Okay? Do you make a distinction in, uh, according to your practice about feelings? Could be sadness, uh, anger. Where do they come from? Are part of the movie? What do you do? Just again, you ignore them? Sometimes when you have very powerful feelings, you need to ask a specific question. Earlier today, I mentioned, what is this? As a kind of subject-oriented question, what is it that sees with my eyes, hears with my ears, feels with my heart, thinks with my mind? We call it a subject-oriented question. It can bring you a substantial experience. But when you have something really heavy-duty going on in your mind, you can make it an object-oriented question. What is this? Where does this come from? Your heart wants to explode for some reason. You have multiple feelings. You don't fight them. You don't escape from them. One mistake is trying to conquer them, and the other is to flee, to run. Okay? Don't fight. Don't run. Stop and perceive. This stop and perceive is in every meditation school, whether it's Kanhua Son in Korean, Shamata Vipassana, you name it. Because the mind works in the same way in any kind of practice, method, or religion. So the deep structure is pretty much the same. So you stop the mind with your practice, whatever you are doing. Some people do mantras, some people use questions, some people use visualizations. But once you stop the mind, you are able to perceive cause and effect. If not, you are either running or fighting. You ask the question. The question puts a distance but maintains visibility. Okay? Maintains perception, but stops the attachment and identification. So you ask, what is this? Where does this come from? And then, like with puzzles, the missing pieces begin to fall into place. It's not your analytic process. It's not something willful with your feelings. Again, you stop your consciousness and just perceive like in a mirror. And then it happens seemingly by itself. Why? Because you let it happen. Because you activated the self-cleansing capability of your consciousness. There is no specific method, but every method can lead you there. And sometimes it happens that the feelings or the thoughts are so powerful that the question crashes and it just 
boom. And then mantra is important. Then whatever happens, you keep your mantra. Gate, gate, para, gate, para, sam, gate, bodhisattva. You shift your attention from the wall to the gate, from the karma to the dharma. And then you keep that no matter what. You hold on to it like the thread of Ariadne that can lead you out of the Minotaur's maze, the labyrinth of your own unresolved karma. So the second method is the mantra itself. And if you use that, you can achieve three things. One is that you protect your own mind against your own harmful influence. We can be our own worst enemies or our own best friends. All right? The second, every mantra has a meaning. So if it's part of a tradition, not just some marketing, then it has some transcendental element. And that takes primary position, the most important position in your mind, like your own totem pole. That meaning starts to take precedence over the karma that you were afraid of or you were attached to. And then the third is that the other types of noise from your other kinds of everyday life karma or from anything subconscious begins to recede. So these three functions work very well with the mantra. The question has a different way of working. Like I said, it puts a distance between you and your mind object. It's cooler. It's more methodological. But it cannot handle emergencies so well as the, as the mantra itself. So ask the question if your mind is strong enough to handle direct perception. Because the mantra acts like a firewall. You need it. Otherwise, you would be crushed. You would be shocked. You would be broken. And once the mirror is broken, then you go to mental hospital. You don't want that. So don't let your mind mirror break. Endure. Patient endurance. It's the key concept in meditation practice. But to be able to do that, you need good methods. I've just given you two. Use them. Part of the other question that I had for you was, as a regular person, that devote maybe certain type of the day to meditation, sometimes not even every day. What it happened, yes, while the practice is happening, I, for periods of time, the, the shatter, the dialogue inside stop, but the moment is finished, it just go back. So how do we continue a normal life and reduce the, the crazy movie that is happening all the time? You say, Maybe not every day. Well, I say certainly every day. Okay, good. If you can go to your bathroom every morning, then you can meditate every morning and you can wake up every morning physically and mentally. Just make an effort. Don't check the results because it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Okay. Do your everyday practice with the help of a valid tradition where there's a teacher's lineage, where there's some valid dharma and there's a student's group. Okay? Teacher, teaching, Students group, the three important elements, like in a tripod. You miss just one of them, the rest falls. Everything's broken. And then you set up a lifestyle. Earlier today in the introductory, I spoke of our own environment as the primary practicing environment. It doesn't mean you don't meet other people. It doesn't mean you don't have rental spaces for larger groups. But if you do not practice in your wonderful infrastructure, which is suburbia, mm -hmm. then you will not get anywhere. Don't wait for the next temple in the neighborhood. It's not going to happen. Okay. If you do not make practice, this mental cleansing as part of your everyday life, then this tremendous flow of information will cloud your mind in two seconds. Look at kids who are totally in love with their mobile phones. They can't go without it. They have ADD. They can't study. They have no real relationships except for some other teenagers, very few, because they are all the time. Da, 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 da. And using these devices are okay if you can stop. But they can't. They cannot. So it's big concern for the current generation. How do they actually survive without any digital input? I'm not saying everyone is dependent. But you look at that karma and you see how captivating sensory perception is, how captivating thinking and feelings are. And that's when you ask the question, 
you detach, you stop the energy input, you perceive, you don't move, you let karma come and go, and your moment then is clear. And keep that moment clear as long as you can. And there's nothing that can substitute formal practice. So do not kid yourself, oh, I'm meditating while I'm driving. Yeah, after two years of intense practicing, driving becomes meditation. It, it is possible. Or I'm meditating while I'm speaking over the phone. Yes, after two, three years of intense practice, and you maintain it every single day, morning and evening. Then it transforms into that, not before. Okay? So just do it. That's all it takes. More questions? If actually we are the product of our karma, individual, group, etc., etc., four type of scar four type of karma. Basically, if I uh, if I solve my karma or work work them through, then then what I am, I am just the same than everybody else, right? No. And no, no, it's not right. We are not the same as everyone else. This is a kind of common wrong view, and I'm not criticizing you. I'm criticizing the view. And at the beginning, you said something very interesting, that we are the product of these four kinds of karma. No, we are not. We are actively contributing to this, and we are conditioned by this karma. This conditioning is not being identical with, and least of all, being the product of it. We are not machines. We are not programmable entities, but we are conditioned to be the persons that we are before we wake up to that conditioning. Then we can turn that around. We can educate ourselves. We can bring ourselves to awakening. We can change our character. So we are conditioned by the outside world, but we can go beyond that. To the extent we perceive karma and the way it works, to that extent we can go beyond that. And if people are completely ignorant, then they are completely identifiable with their karma, totally. That's the equation, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. I just would like to ask about freedom, going back there to the beginning of the, your uh, Dharma talk, about freedom that actually, um, can it be freedom that I have a choice and going back to the two seconds, uh, going back uh, to the things that you just said about karma even and the conditioning, uh, that uh, can it be my freedom that I can actually, uh, I can choose uh, between my karma and uh, and uh, something something different can it can it be itself freedom and nothing more be more specific yes. your, your so question sounds like theoretical physics yeah i know i know i'm sorry um, don't be so, just yes. make it count and make it really clear and specific so um okay then so then again then all right then what is freedom then please say that again i've already said that i know but would you refrain it? No. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Are you happy with your choices? Not all the time at all. That's when you cannot exercise your freedom correctly. If you're happy with your choices, then you have exercised your freedom. In the West, we have a very infantile concept of freedom. It's getting what we want, it's being happy, being always in the pleasure realm, and not having to worry about anything and anyone so it's like sensory happiness without responsibility. Look at that. Mostly we have that in mind as a false image of heaven. But in the Orient, they never had that. When freedom and responsibility connect, that's your path to become adult spiritually. So you have free choice, but choices make up commitment or commitments, and then you have responsibility or just simple cause and effect. And when we avoid that, when I do not want to realize that, we can go to three places. One is hospital, because we get sick. It's the usual thing when our minds are not clear and it makes the body sick. Psychosomatic illnesses, truckloads of them. The other is more serious. That's when people go to jail, because they refuse to perceive cause and effect. And in the old days, when they had a big problem with the world, themselves, society, they went to the temple. They cut their hair, became monks and nuns. And in all cases, you have a very stark realization. You cannot escape 
cause and effect. But if you change yourself, you can change your relationship to it, and in a totally redefined fashion, freedom comes again. It comes again as a totally redefined concept. And I'm not going to blow the punchline, what is your freedom? Because your freedom is your job to find. We can point you to the right direction. We can offer you the way. But we will not give you the freedom because by that we would take it away. Those people who tell you your future steal your future. Those people who are about to give you your freedom actually take your existing freedom away. Think about that and be very careful. I'm in recovery, meaning I need to be able to help somebody else in order to help myself. And I often find it difficult to be able to separate from somebody else's problem and maintain my own peace of mind. And I do feel most rewarded, though, when I feel like I'm being useful and helpful in making a contribution. So I'm, my problem is how do I balance between the two uh, opposites of, or what appear to be opposite of me, taking care of my own needs, maintaining my own well-being, but at the same time feeding my well-being by being as helpful and useful uh, to others as I can be without losing my uh, Look, sense of balance. Our cars need maintenance. Our body and mind also need maintenance. So have your maintenance time, morning and evening. And then during the day, you can help others. Do not identify with karma, but try to fix it in, within yourself and also in other people. See the similarities where you can help each other and see the differences where you actually cannot. And do not touch the critical button of another person because they themselves cannot handle it. And if you cannot, it explodes or collapses. There are two ways that this can happen. One, that it explodes. There's anger, there's shouting, there's lots of conflicts, okay? And the other is silence, separation, disconnection, and that is the yin problem, it is implosion. When you help someone, you have to be strong and clear inside with a lot of good qualities that I have mentioned today in order that this help would actually be brought home. That it would not stop at the wall of somebody's ego, it wouldn't bounce back, but you can gently open the door to somebody else's soul and offer help. But you can only go as far as the doorstep. Then they have to take it. And if they don't take it, then don't feel bad about it. Because then they will have to go through their own hell, through their own suffering, before they are worthy of someone's help. You know the inverted bell curve. Everybody who is dependent has a passion problem, they go through the inverted bell curve. So if all else fails, you can always ask, what was it at the very bottom of the bell that made you start, come up? And that question takes away everything, everything. Everything else is a detail compared to this. Because something made you say enough. Enough suffering, enough abuse, enough controlled substance, enough attachments, enough. And then something began to change. What was it that inside made that crucial decision and the person didn't die, that you didn't die? Because one more shot, one more bottle, one more step, you're dead. Something made you change. What was it? And I'm not naming it for you tonight. I will let you explore that. We're going to do that tomorrow. We'll, we'll be doing that as practitioners every day. We'll have Dharma events, retreats, and many activities that will help you explore that and attain that. And by that, we become not just better people, better families, or better groups. We can make this world a better place to live and die. So I hope. We will all practice together in one way or another, attain enlightenment and save all beings from suffering. 
Thank you very much for your attention tonight.